welcome to episode six of Attention Engineer. I'm Laura Kidd, producer, songwriter and solo artist making music as Penfriend. Find me around the internet at Penfriend Rocks. In this noisy world, the gift of someone's attention is priceless. So thank you for joining me on my quest to go deeper, past the headlines and the hearsay, to have the conversations I've always hoped for with some of the artists I admire the most. I'm fascinated by the creativity, grit, determination, and sheer blagging required to make a career in the arts. So this podcast is my excuse to be really nosy with as many other artists as I can persuade to talk to me. Thank you for encouraging me by tuning in. This podcast is supported by Arts Council England and the National Lottery and powered by the Correspondence Club. More on that later. Hello, hello, hello. I'm beaming into your face today from my very humid home studio, The Launchpad in Bristol, where I've pretty much been hiding out for the past three months. How are you bearing up? I hope you're keeping well. Now this podcast is up and running, I've been collecting my thoughts and demos together to finish off the debut Penfriend album, and I've been making really good progress. I've worked for myself for a very long time, but I'm always trying to learn better ways to manage my days. So recently I've been experimenting with a very simple but effective productivity technique I like to call putting my phone in the kitchen cupboard. It's a real winner for me. If I can put physical distance in between me and my phone, and even better, not look at emails on any device till the afternoon, I'm able to get a hell of a lot more done. I highly recommend it. As a bit of a productivity nerd, I've been sharing some of my findings on my blog. Last week I wrote a piece called How Not To Get Overwhelmed By Big Projects and The Danger Of Endless Lists. So check that out if you need a bit of a nudge, or something to read while you're procrastinating, and I'll be writing more on the subject soon. Now to my fantastic guest. Tom Robinson first became known in the late 1970s as a musician and LGBT activist with the Tom Robinson Band, who were early supporters of Rock Against Racism and Amnesty International. In 1977, their top five debut release, 2468 Motorway, became one of the landmark singles of the UK punk era. Other hits included Glad To Be Gay, Up Against the Wall and the band's debut album Power in the Darkness, which went gold in the UK and Japan. As a solo artist, Tom had further hits in 1983 with War Baby and Atmospherics Listen to the Radio and co-wrote songs with Peter Gabriel, Elton John and Dan Hartman. As a radio broadcaster over the last 30 years, Tom has hosted programmes on all eight of the BBC's national radio stations and won two gold Sony Academy Radio Awards. He currently hosts three shows a week on BBC Radio 6 Music, was a member of the Ivan Novello Awards Committee for 10 years, and in 2016 was awarded a Fellowship of Lippert in recognition of his support for new music artists through BBC Introducing. His music blog, Fresh on the Net, currently offers an open door to new tunes and free insider advice for independent and emerging musicians. As one of those independent and emerging musicians, I can tell you firsthand how exciting it is when Tom Robinson plays your track. So if you're listening and you make your own music, head to Fresh on the Net as soon as you can. I'm so excited to share this frank and free-ranging conversation with you, but just before we get started, here's a content warning. For swearing, discussion of a nervous breakdown and the benefits of therapy, and one mention of suicide in the context of lyrics helping people. Here we go. First of all, I want to, I'm so pleased and delighted and honoured that you want, wanted to do this. This is really cool of you. So thank you. Um, being interviewed, surely that's talking about yourself, isn't it? Uh... Well, I thought that most musicians would be into that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> most of the people I've asked have said yes, <laughs> so I'm correct. <laughs> but I don't know, I was, I was quite nervous to email you and ask, so thank you. I, was, I really appreciate it. No problem at all. Because... Um, I don't want to dismiss anyone else who's been on this so far, but you're a bona fide pop star. Oh. Top of the pops level. Oh, come on. And the rest. So that's that's awesome. Like in, in a time when Top of the Pops was beamed into everyone's living rooms, you were on Top of the Pops. Oh, those were the days. <laughs> and of course, like you've, you've done many things since. So it, maybe it's amusing that I'm p- picking that one thing out to start with. But how does it feel to have those kinds of memories like of your 
of your pop career. What's that like? Well, it's on the one hand, you're proud to have done it and the memories of having had a goal and then having achieved it. Yeah. But then uh, it's the past. It, the past yeah. goes, you know, it's gone. <laughs> so all that really matters is the now, uh, in a sense, because we haven't got the past anymore and you can reminisce about it, but it's certainly limited relevance to our lives today and the situations we face today. So, uh, you know, the, all that stuff about being a yesterday's man or, a, you know, a has-been or a never-was and everything, uh, you're a, in that world, you're only as good as your last hit record. And I thought it would validate me back then. Uh, that's why I tried to do it. But then, of course, if you pin all your hopes and your sense of self-worth onto that, um, when it's taken away, then you're fucked. So uh, I had it, I lost it, I got it back, and then I just let it slide. And so uh, it was a much happier state of things, uh, not to take it so seriously second time around when I had a follow-up hit seven years later. That sounds like a very healthy way of looking at this stuff. Uh, it was helped by 10 years of psychotherapy. <laughs> that will help. <laughs> it does. You know, that's the message to give people out there is, you know, help is available and it works. And, uh, you know, it's quite hard. Sometimes it's quite hard, feels quite hard to inhabit your own skin. And we all experience that. But uh, if if it gets intolerable, there is help. So if you break your leg, you go to the hospital, you know, you you break your heart you also need a bit of help absolutely i've always found songwriting helps me with that yeah songwriting is therapy can't be beaten a bit cheaper as well <laughs> <laughs> in some ways a lot cheaper how do you define success then because you've said what success is not i think uh success is keeping on keeping on um I had a very wise mentor when I was uh, in my late teens. I had a nervous breakdown at 16 and went to a therapeutic community in the wilds of Kent. Uh, and it was run by an ex-public school housemaster in his 70s. And it was the most extraordinary thing. It saved kids from the penal justice system, from the mental health system, and brought us back. And his motto used to be, see things through, and then he would just change it to just go on. And I think the ability to see things through, finish what you started, and then just the ability to carry on and do the next thing, it's underrated. People don't realise quite how hard that is and how important it is. Yeah, and I think talking about this stuff at a time of global crisis is quite interesting. Because for me, I mean... It's only, was it the fourth day of a lockdown in the UK at the moment as we're recording this? And I'm veering between trying to be a really sort of relatively productive, creative person working on a record, working on a podcast and all this stuff, and then stopping and going, none of this matters compared to this giant thing that's happening. And what actually can I contribute? And, and who do I think I am to sort of place any importance on what I'm doing? But really, that's, I mean, there's always something bigger than us. There's always something more important going on. Yep, that's that's certainly true. But I think this is, as you just said, unprecedented. It's it's there's been nothing like it in our lifetimes, and there may have been nothing like it in the last hundred years. Uh, I I don't think that's an overstatement. No, I don't because think so. uh, the virus is the least of it. It's the very very least of what's happening, what's impending, what's going to happen, and. Uh, they're blithely talking on the Today programme on Radio 4 about, you know, on the other side of this, will there be higher taxes? Who knows what the <laughs> wow. what the fuck is going to be on the other side of this? The other side of this. What, what a thing to worry about. <laughs> what, what will that even look like, you know? If we have a financial meltdown uh, and the whole world economy is built on fairy dust, really, it's just figures on spreadsheets. There is no money there. There is no wealth to actually sustain mm. the money that we think we have in the bank. Um, when all that falls apart, the virus will be the very least of it. It's it's kind mm. of um, how will world society even survive? Not that I'm being pessimistic or anything, but I... I <laughs> but I, I, You're right. As you say, we're yeah. carrying on as if the past is then going to come back again, and it isn't. Mm. It, the, the world that mm. we knew... Uh, six weeks ago is no longer no longer going to come back 
I'm trying to think of a segue into asking you about writing with Peter Gabriel. Now, but it seems really irrelevant. <laughs> well, we Peter Gabriel sung about apocalypse before now. Uh, well, yes, yes, he has very, very beautifully and very wisely, and as have many artists. That's a good segue. Well done. Oh, there you go. I feel like everything I do at the moment, every conversation I have with anyone about anything, has to have a massive disclaimer at the beginning where I go, "I do understand that none of this is really important." However, <laughs> let's talk about this thing. Well, um, you could always yeah. edit that bit to put it at the end. <laughs> Maybe a nice takeaway for everyone yeah. from Tom. Well, just focus, focus for fuck's sake. Mm. You know, plan for the unplannable. So, how are you spending your apocalypse? Spending my apocalypse working at home, making radio programs to keep people happy. Well, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. So th- Is that going well? Yeah, we did a Mother's Day program last Sunday. I braved the uh, outside world and drove in my little bubble into the West End, a deserted West End, parked, put on my haz mask, put on my gloves, went into the BBC studios, deserted, uh, and went in and disinfected the microphones of the studios, did a program for Mother's Day. We had Billy Bragg's brilliant song about Mother's Day on there. And listeners just sharing their thoughts, sending messages to their mothers, to their loved ones, to their kids. Um, It was quite emotional. And I guess if if I have any kind of useful role for as long as they give it to me, uh, then as a broadcaster, you can do that thing of kind of bringing people together and giving them a sense of I don't know. Is it false hope? No, but I think it's it's just humanity. That thing like last night when we went out onto our doorsteps at eight o'clock and you felt part of something bigger and you saw all the other neighbours out on their doorsteps and uh, that's what we need more of in this time because we can't know tomorrow no. and the past really doesn't matter. There's only the now. I made an album called Only the Now and it really, it's that, it's that meditation thing. It's just this moment that we're talking right now. That's all we've got. Yeah, yeah you're right. And the moment anybody's listening to this, that's all we've got, just this one moment. Can't change the past. We can't know the future. We've got to kind of inhabit the now in as positive a way as we can and uh, not have too many illusions about either the past or the future. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm tearing up a little because I um, went out on my doorstep last night and we clapped. And we've got this WhatsApp group for my small part of my neighborhood. Um, and I was reminding people to come out. And I thought, oh, am I the annoying person at number four, like trying to tell people what to do? Because I have obviously issues um and then went out and, and it was yeah just looking all the way down the street all the way up this street everyone clapping I had a saucepan and a and a spoon and my dogs did not like that but I did it anyway and yeah. and it, I was just in in floods of tears it was a it was a beautiful moment of connection and I think that is what radio can do yeah that that's magical what radio can do bringing people together in those spaces with a with a, such a familiar voice as well because you have that I mean, even talking to you now, I, I feel like I'm just listening to you on the radio. But then I remember I have to say something too, because <laughs> it's that beautiful, you know, yeah, that that really familiar, friendly voice that you have. Oh, you're very kind. It's great. You're very kind. And you've been doing it for a while, right? 1986 World Service. Yeah, that was the first one I did. I mean, you get better at it the longer you do it. Uh, it's it's like <laughs> anything. You're going to the gym. The lo- the longer you do it, <laughs> yeah. you do gradually improve. Yeah. Um, I was a bit rubbish, I must say, uh, you know, the early radio shows I made. I didn't know what I was bloody doing, but, uh, yeah. Well, no one does, though, do they? You don't. But what was it like being, so being an aforementioned pop star and then someone offers you a radio show? Did you think, yes, I I want that? Was it an intentional thing? Were you trying to do that or was it out of the blue? Uh, Radio was just a sideline for me till the start of the 21st century, you know, 2002, when Six Music started. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I fell into it all accidentally. Uh, A radio producer from the World Service came to see a show in 1984 at the Dominion in London. And, uh, you know, this is on the back of my comeback hit, War Baby. And uh, she came backstage and I thought she was going to say, uh, what a great show, I really love your songs. And she actually said... I really like the bits in between the songs when you talk to the audience. Ah, Uh, that's how it happened. Yeah, she preferred the talking to the singing, to be honest. (laughs) But anyway, she said, I think you've got a good voice for radio. So she gave me my own 15-minute program slot on the World Service the following year uh, called New Waves on the Shortwave. And we only managed to get about three or four songs in per program. (laughs) But uh, 
it, it was a good start. Then I got to Depp on Radio 1. I sat in for Janice Long, uh, first when she was on maternity leave, I think, and also when she went to Japan. Uh, and that was an eye-opener to work on proper mainstream pop radio. You suddenly realize it's actually the producers who run it, which is certainly very much the case there. The producer said, right, this is what we're playing tonight. Not, we've brought you in as a music expert to play whatever the fuck you feel like. Yeah. Uh, it's always a bit of a shock to to guest presenters when they come in from the world of pop to become uh, star guest presenters. Do you think songs can change the world? Hmm. I think audiences can change the world. So a song might kind of give uh, encouragement to the audience mm. to go and change the world, but I don't think the song actually in itself um, really does. I don't think any... National Front skinheads ever came to a Rock Against Racism concert and suddenly saw the light and went, oh, God, I'm so stupid. Of course, people should live together and tolerate each other and yeah. you know, live in a nice harmonious society. But the people who were already anti-racists turned up to those concerts and realised they weren't alone. It's like a parabolic mirror, what the artist does at those kinds of gigs. You reflect the audience's own energy back to them you focus it and you f send it back to them in a stronger beam. And then they go out into the night and the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, they argue with people in pubs. They argue with people at work, with their parents, with their schoolmates, whatever. And that's where the world starts to change. And I'm sure it's through that that, for instance, we managed to get LGBT rights so much more on the agenda. We managed to get so much more equality uh, for LGBT people, and, uh, you know, marriage equality everywhere except Northern Ireland was unimaginable. And uh, that came from individuals coming out, having the courage to just be themselves, and people who knew them going, oh, right, they're one as well. That's okay then. Well, I was re-watching the performance you did at the Secret Policeman's Ball of Glad to be Gay. I was re-watching it the other night, and one of the first comments on, on YouTube was someone saying that people need to realise how important it was to hear those words at the time because people were being fed all this bullshit about how evil gay people were, about how they were child molesters and all this absolutely despicable shit that was just proliferating through the media. And so your average person who hadn't or didn't know that they'd met a gay person had these ideas that were fed to them and then hearing, oh, this is a person who is gay, talking about that experience, that would have had a massive impact though. And yes, the audience are way more powerful than I think even they now understand than the person on the stage. Yeah. But those, those words do mean something. They do change things, I think. Well, I hope you're right. And uh, of course, in individual lives, that song that I wrote at that time has had its own kind of effect. And just getting letters from people who were suicidal and decided not to is kind of really, really sobering mm. to find that. So, yeah, if it, if it's helped somebody individually, that's brilliant. And uh, I'm really proud to have done that. And it really gets stuck in your head, that song. Oh, well, I think that particular performance of Glad to Be Gay at the Secret Policeman's Ball is one song I would kind of recommend to somebody who'd never heard of Tom Robinson was interested to know what did he ever do that was interesting then point them at that performance. Yeah. Uh, that, would be a, that would be a good example. And it's so angry as well. And it's so, it's just so very, like in the moment, like you've been talking about, just, you know, nothing exists but that in that moment. And that's so wonderful to see that. You're not just singing some pretty words, which is what some musicians do. Well, it's particularly angry there because Amnesty International didn't recognise LGBT people as political prisoners. Uh, so they didn't categorise that as anybody that they would support when people were in prison for their sexuality in other countries. And uh, there was a lot of anger in our community that Amnesty didn't recognise that. So yeah, singing that song at that event to that audience was an aggressive gesture. Yeah. But, you know, not much of an aggression because they weren't like dead against us. It was just no. um, it was just ramming a point home uh, to these nice liberal middle class people who ran ab <laughs> amnesty. We can all be better, can't we? Bless them. You know, they have changed, of course. You yeah. know, they do support they do support us now. So fair, fair play to them. Yeah. Well, I, I just think you're wonderful. So it's very nice to be talking to you. I'm a bit shy. Oh, um, <laughs> I can stand any amount of this. Yeah. <laughs> can you call every week, please? Just give me a bit of an ego boost. That would sure. be great. I'm up for it. <laughs>
Um, so you've talked a little bit about some of the lows of being a pop star and some of the mental health issues you went through. How do you look after yourself now? Do you find that life without doing lots of touring and things suits you better? Where do you feel most comfortable in an artistic life? At the moment, we can only really talk about the past because we don't yeah. actually know what kind of world we're on the brink of entering into. So I'd, I'd say that by the time I hit 50, I'd been on the road for best part of 30 years and uh, touring was getting a bit old, just going out for uh, the sake of economics with one acoustic guitar to play gigs because I couldn't afford a band. And of course, audiences dwindling as a result and then playing to 50 people with an acoustic guitar, bashing out the same six 30-year-old songs that they'd heard in their youth. You know, it, there wasn't much dignity in it and there wasn't much enjoyment in it. And um, yeah, I I wasn't enjoying being on the road at that point. And also getting older, you get more aches and pains and uh, it gets physically harder to sleep in cheap hotels and be on the road in a car, carrying equipment in and out of venues every night. Well, you know. You're just summing up exactly how I was feeling last year. <laughs> so that's why I'm nodding so much. We all know what that's like. Yeah. So it was a godsend when accidentally I got involved in the startup of Six Music. What happened was a friend of mine from Radio 4, who produced me when I had my own series on Radio 4 earlier in the 90s, said, could you possibly do us a favour? Uh, there's no money in it, but we're just researching a project for the BBC's new digital services, which are under wraps at the moment. Could you just come in and read out, that was, this is, that was, this is, in between a load of records, because we want to try out some playlists. So... Uh, as a favour to him, I went in and went on a microphone and he gave me a script and I just went to, that was the strokes with last night, this is, you know, whatever. And he said, thanks very much. And a couple of weeks later, called me back and said, uh, yeah, we quite like that. Could you come and read some more for us? Because we're gonna, we've changed the playlist, so we need different links. And so I, I was just helping out as a kind of voice for hire to come in and just read bits between songs so they could hear how the songs would work in a hypothetical radio station. And gradually, bit by bit, I got more and more sucked into coming in more and more often uh, until I was kind of unofficially one of the people that was around the building. And I was there the day that the head of Radio 2 came in and called everyone together and said, we've got it. They've said yes to the network. It's going to be called Network Y. And, uh, we're going to look for a proper name for it, and it's going to go on air in March 2002. And so um, great rejoicing, champagne being cracked. And uh, a few weeks later, Leslie Douglas, who went on to be the head of Radio 2 herself, called me in and said, uh, we'd like you to present uh, our evening show four nights a week. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that because uh, I have to tour to, to pay the mortgage. So I couldn't do four nights a week because I have to be out there on the road. And she said, well, how much do you make out there on the road? And uh, I, I gave her the figure, which wasn't really very much. And she said, well, we'll, we'll pay you that, not to. Oh, wow. And so uh, that was it. I suddenly was able to sleep in my own bed, see my kids grow up, and know where the next penny was coming from. And so that was it. I had to learn fast how to operate a, a radio desk, how to broadcast live. Mm. It was hard. Um, it, it is quite hard facing a microphone and a blank studio. And yeah, of course. Learning to talk as if someone's listening because you never, ever know if there is. Um, and for a lot of, lot of the time earlier on, there wasn't. Uh, <laughs> Good practice, though. <laughs> but it was good. It was good practice. Yeah. So, yeah, that that was a wonderful opportunity. I guess the elephant in the room, Laura, that we have to talk about, though, mm. uh, is we've been talking about being glad to be gay in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about seeing my kids grow up in the noughties. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened in between? Well, late onset bisexuality came and uh, slapped me around the head. I didn't believe in bisexuals, to be honest, in, uh, in my 20s. I thought mm -hmm. it was just gays who hadn't come out properly. You know, right. it was, I thought it was just people 
being a bit mealy-mouthed, saying, oh, I'm bisexual, actually, because they didn't want to commit themselves to saying I'm gay and having the stigma of that. And I always kind of felt our enemies don't differentiate. The queer basher still kicks your teeth in, even if you've got a wife and kids at home. So, you, you know, so um, I d didn't believe in bi until it happened to me. And I met my wife at a gay switchboard benefit concert in 1982. And uh, we just became part of the same circle of friends and just gradually gravitated to each other, became closer. And uh, then suddenly in 86, we both split up with our respective boyfriends and uh, ended up with each other. And it took off like a prairie fire. And uh, within six months, we were cohabiting. And within a couple of years, we were planning a family. Now, unfortunately, the Sunday people thought this was a really good story. Oh, no. Yes, of course. So um, in those days, there was no internet. So there was no way that anybody who's kind of sort of in the public eye, because by that point I wasn't really um, a frontline celebrity anymore, uh, there's no way that somebody who's sort of in the public eye could actually put their own side of anything. No. no. All you could hope for is a retraction in the same paper, printed as big as the original thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in any case, what they were saying wasn't untrue. So the Sunday people asked me for an interview. I said, fuck off. They asked my manager to arrange an interview. She said, fuck off. They waited outside our house till my w wife came, future wife came home from work on her motorbike, snapped a picture of her and asked her for an interview. She said, fuck off. They tracked my dad down on holiday in France and said, asked him about for comment about my love life. And he said, fuck off. And I thought that was the end of it. But that Sunday I was in the news agent. I've told the story before a thousand times, but I, I saw a copy of the Sunday people and it said inside exclusive with Tom Robinson. And oh God, it went against the grain, but I had to buy a copy. Uh, and uh, there was a center page spread in color that uh, actually said, uh, Britain's number one gay in love with girl biker. <laughs> My Passion for Blonde by Rocco Robinson. Wow. And they made up all the quotes. It was uh, <gasps> it was just daft. And the thing was, this is at the height of the AIDS crisis when the tabloids yeah. are slagging the hell out of our community. You know, pulpit poofs and, uh, you know, mm. plague, all these kinds of horrible headlines. So... At a time when the anti-gay hatred was at its height, for a tabloid to then pronounce that uh, Tom's so glad he's not gay anymore. Oh God, that's awful. Which isn't is it? so fucking far from the case. Uh, yeah. Uh, but of course, you, there was no social media whereby you could just put your own side of it. No. You could send a newsletter out to your fans if you wanted to, but there just wasn't self-publishing mm. in that kind of way that we take for granted today. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. My name was mud for a bit around around our community, and I I would have felt the same if somebody else had done it. I was miffed when Lou Reed and David Bowie kind of made their retractions that oh, no no we're not gay we were only messing about in the seventies and all, all right. the rest of it, and it was obviously perceived as one of those. But anyway, I had a homecoming in uh, in ninety six or ninety seven something like that. Uh, yeah, it must have been ninety seven when Pride finally renamed itself to LGBT Pride and uh, had a bisexual tent on Pride at Clapham, Clapham Common. They had their own stage. Right. And they invited me to go and play. And uh, it was brilliant. It was like a homecoming. I, I rocked up with my guitar and got up on the stage, and it was packed. And and they cheered when I got up. And, and somebody shouted, Where are you being, Tom? And I said, Making babies. And they all cheered. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's wonderful. So it was nice to, you know, I'd so long resisted the label bisexual uh, because, mm -hmm. as I say, I, I, I thought it was a bit of a mealy-mouthed thing that was used to duck the issue. But uh, once I kind of realised it was a true thing and a real thing and uh, I was it, then <laughs> I kind of embraced it because, you know, you want to be part of a community that you actually belong to. I remember reading that you um, obviously were addressing this in the 
maybe not in the media at the time, because as you say, it was very hard to do that. But the point of, of all the fighting for people's rights is to open up the world so that people can love who they want without being ashamed. Yeah. So it makes perfect sense, really, that you wouldn't have to define yourself by these very particular words. But it also makes sense to me that as, as a man who defined himself as gay in the 70s, you wouldn't have known about bisexual people because, you know, straight people didn't necessarily know about gay people or didn't know that gay people weren't evil then. So it, it's just everyone learning and getting better and being more open, I feel. And I think it's wonderful now that, that there's a lot more conversation around pansexuality, bisexuality, all these different shades of grey and other colours in this rainbow of people. Um, but then it's also easy to think that that's what everyone feels like, and they definitely don't. And there's been some really horrific stuff spouted by people about, um, I'm sure I read somewhere the other day that someone in America is saying that the um, coronavirus is to do with gay people, which is disgusting. Like how in this world is that a thing that someone would, would willingly say in the press? So we've still got a long way to go. It would, be, it would be really bad to just assume everything's okay now, I think. Yeah. Back in the 70s, we always kind of believed passionately that you either live in a free and a fair society or you don't. Mm -hmm. And that you can't separate off the LGBT struggle from the struggle for women's equality or for racial equality mm -hmm. or for workers not to be exploited by their bosses, you know, the for fairness. Yeah. It's either free and fair or it isn't. Yeah. So the Gay Liberation Front was always allied to those wider struggles. And that's why you had lesbians and gays support the minors, as in that brilliant movie Pride, really portrayed it well. And we were part of the Rock Against Racism movement because it just went without saying. You can't go, well, yes, but they're homophobic, so we can't support them if their struggle is just. There was always that thing of, you know, should lesbians and gays support the minors because minors don't support lesbians and gays, which at that, at that time they didn't. Right. But the brilliant thing about that whole story and that film was that although minors in general didn't support the lesbians and gays, they still went ahead and raised the money and made the bridges. And, the, and yeah. the following year at Pride, the whole Pride march was led by miners with their banners. It was f fucking amazing. Oh, wow. And the only reason we got onto the uh, legislation program of the Labour Party for, to, to make LGBT rights even an issue on the agenda and for the manifesto of the Labour Party is because the miners' block vote put it on there at the next Labour Party conference. So um, it just just goes to show you should do the right thing whether or not you expect to get a pat on the back for it. Yeah, 100%. Wow. It's so interesting talking to you because you've seen so much of this stuff change over the years. I was going to say that racism and uh, women's equality, you know, haven't come that far. No. Not as far as LGBT rights have. And it's important that we kind of try to level up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and keep aware of the... Black Lives Matter and the Me Too. It, it's all part of the same struggle. You can't like try and live in your own isolated cocoon and say, well, we're all right now. We've got marriage equality. No, exactly. It's, uh, it's part of a wider struggle. Yeah. I was talking to Mark Chadwick for this podcast recently, and he was talking about, I think, I think we were talk, so kind of talking about how, like, how come, I don't know, we're, we're probably being a bit silly, but how come the levelers have never been sort of pulled up for saying something awful in a song? And he was like, well, you know, it's because we're, we're not horrible people. <laughs> and so if you're making music as, and you're not horrible and you don't hate anyone and you don't victimise anyone in your music, then you know, in 20 years' time, your music won't have horribly dated and you won't look awful for the things you said. <laughs> so I think, it, I think you're right. Like, we are all in this together. And yeah, being open-minded about everyone and trying to help everyone have a free and fair society is a wonderful thing to aim for. Yeah, it's, it's an aim, but <laughs> how do we get there? And especially now sitting at home, but we can do some stuff. Especially now sitting at home and especially now with the leaders we have. Yeah. Again, this feels frivolous, doesn't it, talking about this stuff, but I don't think it is frivolous. I would love to know who your audience are and how your relationship has changed with them over the years. With a music audience? I was wondering whether I meant music audience or radio audience, and I wonder if they also cross over. Do you find that you have um, radio listeners because they love your music and that's what brings them in? On the whole, not, no. Um, on the whole, the radio audience are there because of the music by other people that I play. Yeah. Uh, and so 
yeah, it, they're, they're quite often surprised to find that I had a past life uh, and and did this other stuff, particularly the younger ones, yeah. you know, who, who, who've enjoyed the music. And they go, oh, right, <laughs> you, 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 do mu- you do songs yourself as well. Yeah. And especially Americans, actually. Uh, Thurston Moore came in for an interview and uh, we were chatting away and uh, I was asking him about his music. And he suddenly went, Hold on, you're that Tom Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, lovely. I stood near him once, and that's my story. That's it. <laughs> yeah. This is the bit of the podcast where I send a giant envelope of glittery thanks to the fantastic people who support Attention Engineer and my music project, Penfriend. The Correspondence Club is my homemade catalyst, offering member perks galore for an affordable monthly or annual subscription. From just £2 a month, you can get high-quality downloads of all official releases, plus a secret track, podcast extras, invites to secret online gigs, and access to my friendly forum, which is turning into a really lovely escape from social media. We live in challenging times, so there's a free tier as well. Browse all the options at penfriend.rocks forward slash join, and I hope to see you in the forum soon. Back to my conversation with Tom Robinson now, where I found an opportunity to share my standing next to Thurston Moore story in a little bit more detail. Keen listeners might have heard a version of this before, but I've left it in because it leads on to a very cool story from Tom. Because I played Meltdown with uh, when I was playing bass for Viv Albertine and we supported Susie Sue and it was amazing. And then I, I, I was sort of doing the mingling thing afterwards, which I am very bad at, especially when I'm in someone's band, because it's not about me at all. I just played, helped them out, really. And so I was backstage and I was like, oh, hang on, that incredibly tall man next to me, that's Thurston Moore. I love his band very much. Now I've got a choice here. Do I kind of get his attention way up there in the stratosphere and go, hey, Thurston, and then have nothing to say? Or do I just stand next to him and go, I'm standing next to Thurston Moore and that's enough? And that's what I did. <laughs> that's normally what I do. So. But it is it is difficult, isn't it, meeting the famous? Um, oh, yeah. And how to get to talk to them, uh, especially people who are personal heroes of yours. Yeah, I'm not good at it. I remember in in 82, uh, I was in a – I went to a management office. Uh, I was talking to some managers about something or other. I don't know. I was waiting for them to see me in their waiting room. Mm. And I suddenly realized the person sitting next to me on the sofa was Brian Eno. Oh, my God. And, you know, even by 82, I was completely in awe of what he did, what he'd achieved yeah. in the studios, what he with his productions, with his ambient music, and his whole thing of stepping out of the machinery and carving his own unique path through the music industry. And I, I turned to him and I said, I really like your music. And he said, thanks. And that was it. Because you, if you've already closed yeah. it off if you approach them as a fan. There is yeah, there is no possibility yeah. of a further conversation. Right. What on earth can you say when somebody comes up and says, I really like what you do, or that record you did was brilliant. Thanks. End of. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if, if I'd said to him something like, Arsenal aren't doing so well, are they? At the moment. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. I don't know. It, John Peel was always far more approachable if you asked him about something like football or uh, yeah. you know, some band he'd been playing than if you actually say, "Oh, I really like what you do, John." You know, so yeah. uh, it is difficult knowing how to talk to people as yeah. just just a person. But some celebrities are better at it than others. I must say. Mm. Um, let me think about who's who's been really good at putting people at their ease. Billy Connolly. Oh, really? I was once, uh, you know, at a, some party or other, and and uh, it was a buffet lunch, and I had my my plate and was going along the line, and I suddenly noticed it was Billy Connolly standing next to me with his plate, <laughs> and uh, without more ado, he just turned to me and said, "You know, if if you ate the average New Yorker, you'd probably die of mercury poisoning." <laughs> What a random thing to say. I love it. Because of all the tuna fish they eat, because there was tuna on the uh, on the salad bar that we were going to, and that just made him think of it. But he knew that the person next to him would know automatically who he was, yeah. would think that they knew him really well because they would have seen him on the telly. Yeah. And so he wouldn't mind him opening a conversation as if we were really good friends. That's lovely. Jonathan Ross, same thing. Uh, 
I was playing with my band at a school fete somewhere and Jonathan Ross was the president of the Parent Teachers Association. Mm. And so we were in the dressing room and he just walked in and threw himself into an armchair in, in the middle of me and the band and just went, oh, it's fucking murder out there. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's just nice when people can put you at your ease like that, and uh, it's very generous spirited. I think. Yeah, lovely. It's, yeah, it stops so much awkwardness. Yeah, you must have interviewed so many people in your radio career. Like, uh, were there any that you were really nervous about before they came in, because you admired them in some way? Well, obviously the Eno one. Um, yeah. After after that, nineteen eighty two encounter in about two thousand and six an opportunity came up to go and interview him in his studio. And I couldn't so believe it. That was just like lifetime's ambition to actually get to talk to him and record it and put it on the radio hmm. for a whole hour. Wow. So me and the producer went down to his studio, uh, set up the mics and everything, and he talked for an hour. I got him talking about doo-wop. I, got, I knew he liked doo-wop, and so went in there as the – kind of starting point yeah and he he was talking about well growing up near woodbridge in in essex um or was it suffolk i can't remember anyway there was a big usaf air force base um nearby and of course all the servicemen used to come in at weekends and use the cafes in the town and so the jukebox was full of doo-wop records oh. that they wanted to hear in order to bring them in and so he was kind of cut his teeth on that. But anyway, he talked for an hour. And uh, as the clock was ticking up to the hour being over, he'd just joined Roxy Music. So um, he turned to me and said, uh, you couldn't do another hour, could you? Are you, do, you? do you have to rush off anywhere? So we then did a second hour oh, of cool. conversation. And she was just so brilliantly funny and informative. And at that point, he just started working with David Bowie in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then he said, well, I've got to go for lunch now, but could you come back next week? And we came back the following week and did two more hours. Oh, I amazing. got to talk to Eno for four solid hours. It was heaven. Yeah, that was bet. just the, the very best celebrity interview of the person I most wanted to talk to in all the world. I'd much rather talk to him than David Bowie or, you know, yeah. any of those kind of big name people. Oh, wonderful. Because he's got so many ideas about how things work and why they work that way. And, mm. you know. Did any of that stuff get stored anywhere? Um, actually, I can put it over my SoundCloud, I think. Mm. Uh, the only thing is you have to cut down the music because oh, course, obviously yeah. we were, dropping, we we're dropping songs in. And so yeah. if you have complete songs, then you get the uh, intellectual property markers and they pull it down again. Yeah, of course. But yeah, I'll try and do that. That sounds fascinating. I'd love to listen to that. Not to give you too much homework after this or anything, but... Uh, that's fine. I feel like it's really great that now things can get stored so easily, but it obviously means there's so much stuff to try and find, you know, to try and wade through on the internet. But then there's so much stuff that was just, you know, broadcast and then that was it. Absolutely. There's a beauty in that, of course, but I think then it's just like, you know, so many more people could enjoy it now too. Yeah, I mean, it's like gigs too. Um, yeah. I'm in two minds about should you record every gig mm -hmm. for posterity? Because, like you say, you end up with so much stuff. I think in some ways it's much nicer to make it just for the people who are there yeah. that day. And when it's gone, it's gone. I feel that way. I'm really not into people filming gigs from their phones and stuff because I feel like it's not to do with vanity. It's to do with um, not being present and sort of missing the point of what a live gig is yeah. for yourself and for the people who can't see because your phone's in the way and, you know, for the artists on stage who are trying to connect to your eyes, you know. So I think there's a real issue with that or there has been a real issue with that. I think it's a conversation because I feel like the audience, I say it a lot to people that the audience is, um, I mean, they're way more powerful than I am. I'm one person on a stage and there's hopefully quite a lot of the, the, the rest of them doing useful jobs like doctors and nurses and care workers and teachers and things. And I've written some songs that they like, and that's lovely. And I'm not downplaying that completely because I know that art is important and summing up thoughts that people can't necessarily sum up themselves because they, they're not writers, like there's value in all of that stuff. But it's an exchange. It's an exchange between me and them. And I need to get stuff off them, which is much better I think the, the channel there is much better when there's not a phone in the way. So I, I feel like yeah. I can give them more and I can get more in that sort of, yeah, that exchange. Yeah. But it's hard to explain that, though. <laughs> well, it's an interesting philosoph philosophical point, isn't it, about 
you know, a gig is a conversation. Yeah. Because the artist has their say and then the audience has their say. Yeah. Uh, and so many times you see people play concerts and then at the end of the song, they either segue it straight into another song so you don't get a chance to applaud or so they can't hear you if you do applaud. Yeah. Or they immediately dive down and start fixing their drinks or checking their guitar cables and don't even look up yeah. at the audience who are applauding. Yeah. And what you really want to do is say, we really liked that, clap, 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 like we did last night with the NHS. Yeah. We want to do that to the artist. Yeah. And the artist's job is to stand there and take a compliment, to actually shut up for a minute, mm. stop doing what they're doing for a minute and listen to the audience and see what they have to say, yeah. if anything. Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it's interesting because you picking that out is so interesting because that's one of the main things I learned off you, of one of your blog posts, because I'm actually still very bad at taking applause or receiving applause, should I say, because I feel like probably deep down I feel I don't deserve it or I'm not good enough all of those things the, the, probably the reasons why I am a musician and an artist and a songwriter in the first place are the reasons I'm very very deeply uncomfortable standing there accepting it because to me it, it, for some reason in my head it's if I stand there and I accept that applause I'm going look at me I'm great I'm amazing love me which is not at all the tone of, of my shows or, or the, anything that I do in my life but when I was touring with Robin Ince last year we, we talked about this in the car because we were talking about everything in the car as we were driving around. And I, I revealed this to him. And then every time, so I, I would go on and do, I think it's like three or four songs in the middle of, he'd do something, I'd do my songs, and then he'd come back on. And so um, he just left it longer and longer before he would come back after I'd played just to try and get me used to receiving the applause and become more comfortable with it and I kind of hated him for that at the time because I, it felt so awkward because I am the person who wants to just start curling up my cables and run away but yeah the audience are giving you a gift of appreciation and to stand and receive it is okay so again that's only really recently I've tried to learn that tried to reinforce that but I find it hard it goes actually further than that not only that it's okay to receive it but that it's churlish not to receive it yeah yeah, you're right. That's the worst thing. You give something of real value to the audience for three, four, five, six minutes on a stage. You pour your heart out. You put it there. Yeah. You've done your thing now. They've got to have their thing. And you shouldn't go, it's my ego if I stand here and enjoy your applause. <laughs> no, it's not. It's real <laughs> ego to think that you don't deserve it. It's That's far more egotistical right, in yeah. a way. I see what you, you mean, know? Yeah. Yeah. It's an inverted egotism. Actually, yeah. in a normal situation where it's not about you and it's about them you go yeah and you make eye contact with people who are smiling at you as they're applauding and you go hey thanks yeah uh, you're right yeah you know, little, little thumbs up nod and then the sun you know if you want to be self-deprecating then when it's all over you go goodness that was unexpected <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can fuck it up now <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. or something yeah. like that or trip over my own feet which also happens quite a lot <laughs> yeah I spent 10 years auditioning to be a musician in, in, in my own head, you know, not really thinking I'd done anything good and maybe one day I could call myself a musician. And it was only by ending that last project last year that I went, oh, no, I, I was doing it all this time. Mm. So I was wondering if you had any of those um, sort of realisations. The big epiphany for me was meeting Alexis Corner, uh, who was the kind of father of the British blues. He his his background uh, was, I, I think, Austrian and Greek uh, parents. And uh, he was around in the kind of jazz and skiffle booms of the 50s and then specialised into blues and uh, started running blues nights uh, and formed his famous Alexis Corners Blues Incorporated. And he had a particular gift for mentoring uh, talented young musicians. So people like the Stones uh, came through his band. Mick Jagger was vocalist for his band for a while. Uh, Charlie Watts played drums with them. Uh, he had uh, Paul Jones of Manfred Mann as a harmonica player. He had Ginger Baker as a drummer. Uh, wow. J Jack Bruce played double bass with him. He just had mentored the whole British blues scene. So Nobody much knew what Alexis Corner himself sounded like because he always got these all-star bands together mm -hmm. uh, and guest vocalists, and he was just sort of playing rhythm guitar in the background. But 
I mentioned I went to a therapeutic community uh, age 16 uh, called Finchton Manor, F-I-N-C-H-D-E-N. Um, and Alexis was an old boy of that place. He'd been there during the war, and he came back with his family on a visit in 1969 and uh, was prevailed on to do a little mini-concert for us boys who were there. And we all crowded into you know, the, the chief's oak panelled study and we were kind of pressed up against the walls squatting on the floor it was about 40 people in one kind of study this grizzled kind of 45 year old man in a kind of floral shirt with a shock of wild grey hair stepped through us all into the middle of the room and took out a guitar out of a guitar case and strapped it on and opened his mouth and sang he sang about corrupt policemen, about poverty, about injustice, about evil-hearted women, you know, all the traditional things. He sang yeah. the blues. Yeah, but yeah. it was a revelation that you didn't have to be on top of the pops or on a big stage or have microphones or drums or be a performer on a stage. You yeah. could just, in a room with people, open your mouth, unembarrassed, and sing, mm. just like that. Yeah, It was the direct communication of it was so extraordinary. And he very soon went on to be a broadcaster on Radio 1. He did like world music programs, uh, introducing people to this wild range of stuff that he was into. Mm. That was a kind of role model for me right there to suddenly see that both of those things were possible. Both of them were about communication, really, about sharing, uh, sharing these blues songs that this was originally written by Big Mama Thornton or whatever, whether he's playing the record or interpreting the song himself. So I realized then that that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be one of those. Whatever that is, I want to be one of them. Yeah. And, uh, Alexis, bless him, was a titan. He was really such a major, important talent in the British music scene, and he was so generous with his time and his mentoring. So we had a little band there even at the time, and we were singing into a plastic tape recorder mic taped to a broomstick, and we were saving up to, to get a better mic. Aww. So as he, was, as he was leaving, I said to him, uh, could you possibly... Uh, buy a new microphone for us in London. And uh, he said, well, I'll see what I could do. How much have you got? We said, five pounds. And he said, well, give me the five pounds and I'll see what I can get. So <laughs> he took away our five pounds. Two weeks later, a brand new Sure Unidine came through, packed up in the post, it was worth at least 50 quid in, yeah. those, in, the, in the money of those days, that he'd just bought and sent to us. And our music making was completely transformed because you could hear the vocals. The Sure microphone rejected feedback so you could turn it up louder and it was clearer and suddenly you could do songs. Yeah, You know, that one small act of generosity uh, made such a difference to everybody that was at Finchton and made music. That's so kind. Yeah, it was a lovely, lovely man. Well, we can all do little things, can't we? You know, it's just that sort of sparking confidence in someone. Or, I mean, you do it all the time. You do it week in, week out with your show, with Fresh on the Net, with everything. Well, the message you want to put across is, yes, we can, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, we can. Or, yes, you can, to people who want to make music. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't know, the competition for attention is, is great. People don't realise how many other people are also making music. Yeah. and think that if their song doesn't get immediately picked and played on the radio, they've been, quote-unquote, rejected. Well, there's a lot of emotional barriers to doing this in the first place. And so then, yeah, if you if you find that things aren't going how you imagine they would in the wider world, it's quite easy to take that bit too much to heart, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's only pop music. Exactly. <laughs> there's more to life. <laughs> it's funny, when I was just starting at Six Music, when the station was very new, uh, and I'd made some terrible cock up or you know had got something wrong or said the wrong thing on the radio um and the producer said uh, it's only a little radio show <laughs> put it in context yeah i think perspective is very important in everything in all this that's happening at the moment there's a it's very easy to have moments of, of you know pure selfishness like what am i going to do about this what situation am i going to be in and then just to have that perspective shift of yeah but i'm healthy and i'm in a house and we've got lunch 
there's always a perspective shift you can have. And I think certainly in music, that competitive idea that if if this other person that I'm looking at on the internet is doing well, then that's taking something away from me. So that's the most unhealthy way of looking at things. So it's nice to see people, um, when people actually make an effort to help each other out, especially artists, because I don't know, I don't know why this competitive thing is still in people's minds, really. Never be jealous of anybody else. Never envy anybody else's career, looks, life situation, anything. Uh, That's the one lesson I've learned about getting to the age of 69 Mm. is, A, it's futile, you know, because you are you, not them. Um, But time and time again, I've seen people who I thought, oh, God, I wish I could change places with them. They're doing it so right. Or Mm. how I envy that, you know, oh, he's got such great looks or whatever. And time and time again, I've seen kind of sudden disaster unfold over those people. Joe Strummer, you know, I was Mm. so envious of him being successful with The Clash. We'd come through at the same time and he was managing to write song after song after song and I wasn't. And, uh, oh, Joe's doing it right. Oh, and then the poor man dies of a sudden seizure at a tragically young age. You know, why would I? Thank God I didn't change places with him. Don't be jealous of somebody else, you know. Just have goodwill to as many people as you can around you and do the right thing as much as you can and enjoy the life that God has given you. That's a much more positive thing to say near the end of a podcast. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I can't put the doom and gloom bit here now, but that's okay. We'll just leave that at the beginning. (laughs) So I want to respect your time because I'm sure you have other things to do today. So I'd love to ask you just a few last little short questions, if that's okay. Of course. I'd love to know who your current favourite artists are. Well, that changes from week to week. Yeah, so, um, particularly because of doing the BBC introducing thing, you have favourite artists who've just kind of swum onto your radar, who you're just besotted by how great they are. Mm. So, uh, on the other hand, there's kind of big famous artists like uh, Squid or cabbage or uh kate tempest or uh tricky or whatever you know in in the big league but i'd say of the of the upcoming bunch just on this week's mixtape i've got a band from brighton called youth sector they're just sort of devo-ish swagger and energy with great sort of edge to what they do uh they've got a song called no fanfare out at the moment which uh, opens the mixtape because I just love it. And then Freya Roy up in Norwich, beautiful kind of grooving, subtle, thoughtful music that uh, just shakes hands with your ears. It kind of invites Mm. you in and takes you into its world. Uh, And, of course, Green Tea Peng has been hotly tipped for a long time. I think a lot of the stuff she did earlier on on was kind of willfully uh, inaccessible. (laughs) <laughs> she's okay. she does does make quite challenging music but her latest one which is kind of almost a homage to the specials is called ghost town it isn't the same song she's done her own song just about the way that the london property boom is kind of devastating the lives of working people everywhere uh and she's just brilliant green tea peng wonderful artist again bbc introducing got behind her very early on and mm. and she's done really well so I'd go for those three, Youth Sector, Freya Roy and Green Tea Peng, this week at least. <laughs> Mine changes like, yeah, day to day. So it's a hard question, but thank you for answering it. Um, and what three pieces of your own work would you recommend as a gateway for new listeners? We mentioned the Amnesty International version of Glad to be Gay, mm-hmm. uh, which is on YouTube. So I probably that one would have to be in there somewhere. Um because the actual record that was released by EMI was a live version with TRB, and it's um, I'm, I'm putting on a kind of fake Cockney accent, and it's it's oh, okay. it's not the best possible version of the song, and it's a little bit slow and a little bit out of tune. But that version, the Glad to Be Gay solo version at uh, the Secret Policeman's Ball, would be good. Okay. Um, then I'd like people to check out a song called Merciful God on my 2015 album, Only The Now, which I made with Jerry Diver. And uh, I like listening to it even now. You shouldn't like listening to your own music, should you? But Yes, I do. you should. That's what it's yes. for. <laughs> That's, yeah, you're right. Well, I, th- I think we kind of really nailed it on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, so I read an interview with a bomber pilot 
in the Iraq war, a female bomber pilot who was talking about going out and dropping bombs on the Iraqis. And uh, the interviewee, interviewer said, uh, do you ever worry about what it is you do, the fact that people are dying underneath you as you're dropping these bombs? And she went, oh, no, you see, I'm a Christian, and I believe I'm doing the job that God put me here for. And that phrase was so resonant that in the wake of the 7-7 bombings, you realize that's exactly what people seeking martyrdom uh, are doing. They think by killing a load of civilians at a, at a concert or in a tube train, they're doing God's work. So the song's called Merciful God and, um, you know, doing the job that God put me here for is the kind of refrain. So that one, I think, <laughs> cheerful song, but uh, I think we managed to convey something of the kind of sheer wild anarchic rage that people must feel when they're in that position. Mm. Uh, we're trying to do this anyway. Uh, Jerry Diver did it a great, great job on it. Uh, and then the last song I think I'd be most proud for people to hear would be the 12-inch version of War Baby, which is on my band camp on the War Baby album. And uh, it's there as a bonus track. And it manages to reach into the kind of dark middle of the night, deep in childhood mysteriousness of the original song as originally written, as opposed to the three-minute, well, four-minute pop hit mm. uh, that, that got into the charts. So, um, yeah, please listen to the 12-inch version of War Baby. I'll put them on in a playlist. Thank you so much. Finally, what's your next adventure, Tom Robinson? I think my next adventure is getting through today, and then my next adventure is getting through tomorrow. Yeah. And my next adventure is unfolding day by day. and. You know, each day brings baffling new facts and truths and perceptions. And oh, without wanting to get too pretentious, but T.S. Eliot said, Every moment is a new and shocking valuation of all we have been. That's a good one. And it's so true. You know, just moment by moment, the past means something different, and who you are seems somehow different. So, yeah, my adventure is uh, getting through the day and then getting through the next day. And the day after that, we're all in the dark. We're all in the dark. But just that kind of faith that you can take the next step is like a lantern shining on your feet because you can just see one step ahead by the light of that faith. And when you take the step, the lantern moves forward and you can then see the next step. So uh, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Laura, it's a pleasure. <sighs> That was really exciting! What an interesting man! As well as making his own brilliant music and hosting radio shows every week, Tom does so much for independent artists. So if you're listening and you make your own music, go and read everything on the Fresh on the Net blog immediately. I've put together a beautiful webpage for this episode at penfriend.rocks forward slash Tom. I've gathered together links for everything we talked about, plus that incendiary Secret Policeman's Ball video. Tom has even handwritten me a note to share with you. Go and check it out, penfriend.rocks forward slash Tom. Next week on the show, I'll be sharing my conversation with comedian Beck Hill. And as you may have guessed from the number of this episode, there are five more chats for you to catch up on. Massive thanks to everyone who's rated and reviewed Attention Engineer so far. It's so much appreciated. I make this podcast all by myself, so it's wonderful to hear that you're enjoying it. Till next time, stay safe, make the most of the now, and I'll be back with you soon. L-U-V. L-U-V.